military domination, and state-sanctioned violence. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Lina Meruane. Lina is the award-winning Chilean author of Nervous System and Seeing Red. She has received grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, and was a DAAD writer in residence in Berlin. She teaches at New York University. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And you can order your copy of Savage Tongues from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello, hello. Hello, welcome. Well, let me let me just start very quickly by saying I am Lina Meruane. I am delighted to be in this conversation with the great Azarin van der Viet Olumi, and particularly excited about discussing uh, your savage tongues, uh, Azarin, a very timely meditation on trauma. Trauma that, it, that in this novel takes the form of sexual trauma, but extends to historical trauma. Um, only as introduction for those who have not yet read this amazing novel, I'd like to mention what struck me about this book. And it is the thoughtful and sensual ways in which the writing problematizes cultural assumptions about the bonds created by sex, love, family relations, and friendship. Savage Tongues is quite a transgressive and transformative novel in a cultural climate that does not allow for the exploration and much less the exposure of the idea that the victimizer, Oscar in this case, may also be or may have been himself a victim who is acting out his suffering on others. Or that his victim, later his survivor, Aresu, in the novel may have consented to what she interpreted as love or that sexual abuse can entail pleasure as well as pain. What is also particular about this book, and I've read a few that delve in this theme of abuse, is that it escapes the oversimplified idea that our experiences only belong to ourselves. Savage Tongues interrogates this notion by connecting gender violence to structural violence, and in particular, the violence exerted by colonialism and the feminization of those who belong to the peripheries of the West, or the so-called peripheries. Last but not least, the novel tells us that oppression does not end in the bodies that suffer, that suffer it, but is inherited by the sons and daughters of those oppressed. It suggests that likewise, healing cannot be achieved by individual selves, but rather in community with others who have equally suffered. Many thanks as Irene for uh, writing such an insightful and necessary book. And I will stop speaking so that we can hear uh, a brief excerpt, or the first brief excerpt of uh, Azarin's novel. Thank you, uh, Lina. It's such a pleasure to be in conversation with you. And even though we can't be in the same room, I'm really grateful that we can at least meet virtually um, and and just have the space to talk about all these all these things that you're raising. I'm gonna read um, a brief excerpt. Um, it's quite an immersive novel, so it'll just sort of um, dive right into a scene with, with um, Arzu and Ellie, her best friend. Ellie reappeared in the corridor. I'm sorry, she said. I'm sorry too, I told her. It was my fault. I shouldn't have been so abrasive. You don't need to apologize, she conceded. It's just hard to guess what you're feeling sometimes. I gave Ellie a no knowing look, then walked past her into the bathroom. I needed to wash my face. The bathroom, narrow, rectangular, windowless, smelled damp with mold. The mirror had lost its shine. I looked at myself. 
I looked eaten with exhaustion. I remembered seeing my face staring back at me helplessly from that mirror before, my mouth stretched into a painful grimace. I'd been hungry. I thought of all of the figs Omar and I had eaten that summer, all of the times we pulled to the side of the mountain roads on his Ducati and removed our helmets to pluck fruit from the trees. We'd fed them to each other. We'd been happy, happy at the expense of my future self. I wondered if that younger version of myself had known the power she'd ultimately wield. If she'd known then that I'd be accountable to her for the rest of my life, pushing myself to my limits, trying to retrieve her from the abysmal well she'd found herself in. I wanted to tell Ellie that after that first terrible time when Omar had forced himself onto me, trapped me the way he trapped that wild boar and had his way, I'd gone back for more until it became the most natural thing in the world. I wanted to tell her that my memories of the time I'd spent with Omar outside of the bedroom felt nebulous and disjointed, that I needed to remember more than the earthly taste of Omar's cock, the sour smell of his sperm, the way it spilled onto his belly when he came, soaking his pubes, making his skin glow in the dim light of all the rooms we'd ever exchanged fluids in but I couldn't find my voice. And besides, Ellie was already intimately familiar with my story. And in any case, she had stories of her own. Ellie had witnessed firsthand the power sex has to destroy, to decimate, to stifle. She'd left home at 15, unable to withstand the severity of her parents, the surveillance culture of the wider Orthodox community, the oppression bearing down on her body, the covenants policing her sex curbing her desires. She'd lived on the streets for a year, sleeping under bridges, huddled together with other runaways, relying on strangers' leftovers, which she stole off the tables at sidewalk cafes. She moved in with a man halfway through the year, an older man in his 20s who was far more sexually experienced than she was. He'd insisted that in exchange for a warm bed and shelter, she had to sleep with all of his friends, and she'd done it. She'd removed herself from her body. She'd floated above herself or stood beside herself and watched this other curly-haired girl twist her body to conform to the needs of others. She told me that a few times this girl, this other girl, had lifted her face as if she were searching for Ellie, but that her gaze had been vacant, that she'd stared emptily at something behind Ellie, that after that, Ellie had removed herself altogether from the room. I'd been remorseless toward myself, unforgiving, she'd said to me once. She'd spent years in therapy sewing together all of her dissonant parts. She'd become convinced that the Israelis' unacknowledged violence against the Palestinians, the repressed fear and guilt and grief of protecting one's life at the expense of another's, was erroneously expressed through sexual aggression. Sex, she believed, had become a way for the lost youth of that dense, troubled land to work their way through the cycle of violence and inherited fear that had shaped their lives, entrapped them. As Ellie walked into the bathroom and stood behind me, her plastic peach-colored makeup bag in hand, I remembered that we'd walk, walked past the cafes that she'd stolen cold french fries and half-eaten falafel from, and that we'd realize then that anything that has the ability to create life has the capacity to exterminate it in equal or greater measure. We talked about the fact that sex could simultaneously create life and extinguish it, that people were either in denial of its power or terrified of it. I took in Ellie's face in the mirror. I tried to speak, but the words wouldn't rise up through my chest. There was something in my throat holding them down. I could feel the accumulated pressure of all of the tears I hadn't shed. Some understanding was taking shape, that the constriction in my throat was likely a result of my silence, a silence that had become habitual, that had shut me down, cut me off from myself. I had tried my whole life to recover my relationship to language. I had tried through writing to arrive at the totalizing quality of torture, its capacity to destroy speech, to exterminate the contents of one's consciousness, 
to turn reality itself, all of the concrete objects of one's life, walls, underwear, couches, into participants in one's destruction. But I wasn't sure that I'd found adequate language for my pain. I wasn't even sure that a structure build of war, built of words was capable of containing it. And I'll stop there for now. Oh, that's such a, a, a sort of a charged uh, passage where the exploration of sex comes hand in hand with uh, the question of uh, Palestinians and the violence they have suffered, um, as well as language, right, and the, the possibilities of language. And I was thinking about this uh, image that reappears in your novel, the fact of not being able to speak, right? But this novel is really about a conversation between two friends that come together uh, to sort of, uh, one is accompanying the other to return to the home where everything happened, right? Where the sex scenes were mostly uh, present. And so there's a sort of a, a mirror effect because these are two women who, are, who have been uh, abused sexually, but at the same time consented. So could we could could you explore a little bit more that sort of situation where the limit between uh, consent and rape or victim and victimizer uh, appear? And then I want to talk a little bit more about silence and language. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That's such. I think that's such a great question. Um, I love what you're saying about the mirroring effect between the two women in the novel, and um, I think that that there is an intensity to their friendship that's really informed by both their shared experience of sexual abuse, but also in the ways that they share an understanding of, of how historical and political crisis informs the ways that we treat one another in intimate settings. And that, you know, they're both sort of asking the central question in their lives um, about, you know, what does it mean uh, to desire or what is, you know, if if we're being taught to hate ourselves or hate each other, how does that transform our ability to then um, be intimate with one another and how does it distort our capacity to love? And, you know, as a result of that, you know, their understanding of cons the lines between consent and rape and um, sexual fantasies that might be connected to sexual abuse is really complicated. And I think that um, the process of them going back to Spain is also a process of kind of reverse engineering some of the very simplistic narratives that we have about um, victimization, particularly in the discourse of sexual abuse. And to understand that um, they both struggle with feeling innocent and culpable at the same time. They were both just a hair short of being legally of age, um, you know, and um, they also both were sexually initiated through these relationships that were violent. And so the, that left an imprint on the rest of their sexual experiences in life. And so they can't really separate the way that they have learned that early imprint of desire um, from the way that then that relationship, that early relationship, which was violent as well as erotic, um, informs um, their ability to to sort of indulge right in physical pleasure later on in life. So yeah, I think it's I think it's a very complicated subject matter that really needs nuanced language and a lot of unpacking. The narratives around survival don't actually accurately give you know either represent or give adequate space to women. Uh, to talk about what it means to live with the aftermath of that kind of complicated, right, um, question of, of sex and consent. Yeah, because one of the things that seem um, very interesting to me, and, and we kind of talked a little bit about this in an earlier conversation, has to do with the fact that women have always been silenced about their sexual experiences and their sexual desires as if they didn't have any or they couldn't express any because that would make them dirtier or, or I don't know, less deserving of love. And I find that today there, it's, all, it's also difficult to talk about 
uh, situations of abuse where the limits are not so clear between consent and abuse, right, or pleasure and pain. And um, I would like you to speak a little bit about this sort of difficulty, the, the sort of a little bit of this political correctness that we have inherited for the best reasons, right, to protect mm -hmm. us, but then also uh, making it so difficult to talk about contradiction and complexity. Um, it, I would, maybe you can sort of explore a little bit that that question, the sort yeah. of impossibility to speak, and this can only be said amongst two women who have been in this sort of situation, mm -hmm. or apparently so. Absolutely. I mean, I think you're pointing at something that's so important and difficult to to disentangle because there is a danger when women. Well, first of all, to your earlier point, there actually hasn't been space for women to, um, you know, explore and voice and express publicly in the public domain what their experiences of um, sexuality and sex have been. Um, and then also in the literary tradition, there isn't a great appetite that has built up over centuries for a literature that is so centered on female interiority. Um, we can get, you know, a 600 page novel of male interiority that um, we have already located a spot in our imaginations for receiving that, but it's a lot more difficult um, for a very introspective novel um, by and about women uh, to, to sort of be accommodated, right? And, you know, then to, to, to your other point, it is, you know, difficult and and risky to talk about pleasure connected to pain in a culture that still doesn't acknowledge the level and degree of annihilation, erasure, and violence that women are subjected to, um, particularly because of what is referred to as divided will, right? Where um, that's a kind of legal argument that's been made through centuries, or a social argument that, oh, if you craved it even a little bit then uh, your counterpart is no longer culpable, right? Or, and in addition, you will be also shamed for, um, for that. And what's lost in it is just the, ex the fluidity that sex is, right? It's an entirely fluid experience where your body merges with somebody else and the boundaries of who you are um, become very messy in that moment. And I think that women, um, there's a way in which, you know, the narrator is talking about how her experience of having been violated needs to be trusted. It's sufficient that she feels that way, that she's carried this trauma in her body, and she has a right to her sexual agency at the same time. And that um, just because she conceded to something or uh, was complicit in it or desired or craved it doesn't erase the problematic power dynamics in that relationship that were exploitative or the sexual politics of power, which are informed by dynamics of race and ethnicity and um, exoticization of the, of the East and all of these other kind of complicated reverberations. So it, there's a lot to unpack. Yeah, I was, I was uh, reminded when you were speaking of a moment when Arezu uh, is, is conflicted by the fact that her description of Omar uh, can fall into the stereotypes that we have about Arab men, right? Mm -hmm. As um, uh, abusers, as sexually, as sexual predators, right? And so she is also conflicted culturally on how to name what happened with this man and about who this man actually is, right? So the sort of the, 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 the cultural ad that you're examining there, I find uh, very provocative too, right? How do we describe this situation uh, without further stereotyping Arab men sort of generally? And, um, and I think the sort of the, the cultural question is sort of very, very nuanced in this book. I, I love, uh, sort of the fact that you bring such reflections on culture, sort of uh, expanding the ways in which 
tend to look at these events as private, as personal, as individual, and with, a, with no resonances in the culture, right? So I thought that that was very, very uh, important and, and interesting in this book. Um, I don't know if you want to say something about this or, or shall I move yeah. on to my next question? I can very briefly say that that's part of what the gender dynamics um, that exist in her country of origin and Omar's country of origin then get mapped onto the United States um, means that she as a narrator is very aware that, um, you know, male sort of men from the Arab community, the Arab American or Iranian American community are also targets of violence and that part of uh, the complicated ways in which um, gender dynamics work is that the women in the community also feel the need to protect the men from further being um, being further sort of violated um, through hate crimes or um, this kind of discursive violence. And so for her to, for Arizu to kind of name, um, and, and very she's very aware of this cultural context of surveillance and suspicion toward um, Muslim men and Arab men and Iranian men. And, and she's trying to toe that line of naming everything that happened and at the same time, not allowing that to then be weaponized further to stereotype and cliche him into a different corner, which is in her opinion, very irrelevant to, um, to the actual matter at hand, right? Mm -hmm. Because also, interestingly, Omar has another mirror character in the book, I find, which is uh, Arisu's younger brother who gets mm -hmm. uh, harassed and uh, suffers very, uh, a very terrible scene of violence, um, which the family never recovers from, right? And so I was also thinking that it's interesting how she is reminded uh, of her brother in Omar, right? What has he suffered and she doesn't really know? And there's an ethical question there, which is actually I find quite interesting, right? Difficult to, 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 to think about, uh, whether the fact that this man might have suffered during the Lebanese war and whose father has been killed, Omar's father, um, is, less, is less of a sort of a, of a bad man because he, himself is also a victim. I, I could, could you speak a little bit about that? Because mm -hmm. it's it's complicated, right? To, to uh, think about this man as uh, not responsible for his acts because he's been subject of violence himself. Where do we place that sort of responsibility? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the brother is definitely the reason why she's so protective because the, her brother suffers a really extreme hate crime and that as you said completely changes the story of their lives and informs why she has this and she witnesses the attack and it's a sort of ethnically motivated attack and um she no longer feels safe in america either and so she goes to spain and uh to see her father who's there and in that process omar shows up and it's a way for her to self-destruct right and at the same time, try to understand ethnicity and race um, almost through this kind of consumption that they have that they engage in with one another. Um, the question that you're raising is really important um, and it's tricky. She, Arzu, is mm -hmm. trying to understand what was Omar's trauma. And I think she understands that she experienced Omar as, as as her peer, you know, on some level, because emotionally he's very immature. He's sort of like a fun, adventurous 17 year old at heart. And she realizes that he, his father disappeared in the Lebanese civil war when he was 17. And that that must have somehow, that disappearance, the body disappears, nobody knows what happened, must have truncated him emotionally, right? So there's, it's more that she's trying to understand how she could have not seen, she's struggling with how she could have not understood his advantage over her. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, when, and that's what she's searching for. She's, it's part of her sort of blaming herself um, to say, well, emotionally he was presenting as 17 and 
yes, okay, he, he wasn't, but that's not how she experienced him. It's how she understood things happened retroactively. So there's a question of memory too, how our memories of what happened are constantly changing. And we're always having to reassess and reevaluate. And that these, that's a question, that's the other piece that culturally is not acceptable for the narrative to be unstable, for the narrative of mm -hmm. sexual abuse to change with you as you change and go into different stages of womanhood or even for men, you know, who have been sexually abused because it's not, ex you know, it's, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, no, I, you actually touch on all these themes that are not easily solved, right? And that's what makes this novel so important, I think, to read because it really puts us in a, in a, in a situation where we even question ourselves, I did, as I read, uh, how to how to evaluate, how to think about these problems, right? And the answer is not clear cut. Fortunately, because novels don't necessarily need to uh, emit a sentence, right, or or come to a, a clear cut um, answer. And I was also very interested in the fact that you touch upon a very difficult subject uh, for our cultural climate, which is the the Palestinian oppression, right, uh, by Israel. And uh, you find this Israeli character, Ellie, um, who is seen as a traitor uh, for her defense of Palestinians uh, in, in their territory, right? And um, Ellie describes herself, she, she's a really lovely character. I loved uh, Ellie, uh, the way she sort of worked out all of her uh, past, um, uh, problems and issues with her family and with her own self. And she describes herself as a victim of violence because she says, as a Jewish woman, she did not give her consent to be made a perpetrator of violence against Palestinians. So I find this a very explosive idea. And I would like you to talk a little bit about how you arrived to this idea and uh, why it's so central to your novel. I mean, you do touch upon this mm -hmm. issue many, many times throughout. Yeah, I think it's another, so it's the, the reverse engineering of understanding, you know, um, the question of consent around sex, but also the, the question of consent around politics and um, political violence, right? That I think you, in America, you know, in any settler colonial kind of context, very, very difficult um, and causes, I think, tremendous grief for a lot of different kinds of people. You know, the way that we see in, in the American landscape, um, black bodies and black men being targeted and, um, and you know, the, the, the difficulties and the obligations that I think we have to bear witness to that and to call it by its right name and um, and then to have to not that's not sufficient right it's not sufficient it's it's important to then look at our own implicated subjectivity and to think about how our own histories of privilege um, could have been informed by um, dynamics of, of racism and oppression or dispossession, displacement, right? And that that requires us to be really open to accountability for something that may have happened generations ago. And what I mean by accountability, you know, I think people were very confused about what we mean about that. Um, like we want it to be some concrete action oriented thing that we can enact and then absolve ourselves of our responsibility or our guilt. But I think it's more the capacity to really sit with the shame and the guilt in a way that's forever, you know? And, and that's the only way to be open enough to have these very difficult conversations around how a people who have been historically tremendously oppressed, the Jewish people, then can also be connected to this horrifying oppression of Palestinians who not only were not responsible for what happened, but are also as Muslims, and this is the book also why it takes place in Spain, historically Muslims and Jewish communities were sent into exile out of the Iberian Peninsula with the announcement of political modernity and the 
sort of creation of settler colonialism, right, went um, at the same time. And so there is a shared history and a shared wound that we need to recover in order to kind of understand. And that's not a simple way of saying, you know, we've, we have shared pain, let's, let's be more neighborly. I don't think it's that simple. Um, but I, I think it's a, it's a beginning of, of trying to understand the way that colonialism and um, the logic of empire triangulates people and separates people and um, actually kind of enforces a kind of historical amnesia that, that we don't realize is happening. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to listen to a little bit more of the book. Um, Azarine, would you read it, uh, another fragment? I don't know how we're running with time, but let's... let's. Uh, um, I don't know how we're yes. running with time. Um, okay, I will, since we're on this topic, I'll read, I'll read something um, connected. So this is in Spain. I walked down a narrow street flanked by the puckered walls of the Arab ruins. Great tufts of lavender and capers were growing out of the cracks and seams. I stopped halfway down the road and clung to one of the bushes. I nearly yanked it out of that great ancient wall, those stones that were as rough as sandpaper. The street was deserted. There was no one in sight. I heard my mother's voice. I heard her utter that saying she had so often repeated, God is our only witness. I didn't even know if I believed there was a God hovering in the heavens, crowning our heads. I couldn't wait to get home to Ellie. I thought of the healing power of friendship as I made my way down that empty street, a street as old as time. Friendship, I thought, is a form of witness. She had received my testimony. She had held it with tenderness and love. She had taken care with my story. If it hadn't been for her, I would never have been able to receive Shavi. I could feel myself, my whole body rushing toward Ellie. I thought of her contagious laughter, how we doubled over laughing in the middle of an empty maze of streets behind the Damascus Gate in Jerusalem, the air thick with the smell of incense and the sound of murmured prayers, because I, who did not even know if I believed in God, had been turned away from the Al-Aqsa Mosque that morning by two Israeli soldiers in green fatigues and combat boots, bullet belts strapped to their chests. They were holding machine guns. You're not a Muslim, they said in unison. I was wearing a full hijab. I'd wanted to go into the mosque to pray, to press my forehead against its well-worn floors as a way to be near my mother and her parents, to salute their deep religiosity despite my own confused ambivalence. I had been raised, after all, to greet God every morning, to thank God every evening. Recite the shura, the soldiers commanded, stroking their guns, and I had. I stood there with a fire in my eyes, holding back my pain, hardening my face so it wouldn't show my sorrow or anger. I recited the verses. I recited them for myself. I recited them for the soldiers, for the collective humiliation that we had been forced to perform, for the Palestinian whose relationship to the divine was eclipsed by the occupation, a form of psychological torture not to be allowed to access the sacred sites of one's culture. And as I recited the Ashura in that moment, against all odds, I had suddenly believed there was a God. I had felt heard, accompanied by an invisible fleet of bodies that had gathered at my back to support me. I was sure my ancestors were standing behind me, placing each verse of the Quran in my mouth to be uttered. Halfway through the prayer, the soldiers grew impatient and let me in. And my privilege, in comparison to the Palestinians to whom this land and its sites belonged, was not lost on me. What business did I have entering the mosque while they who were devoted to it were cut off from its walls? I almost turned away, but the soldiers waved me through the arched passageway with their guns and a nod of their heads, and I walked, aware that I was a target, that all of my life there had been a gun pointed at my back. I walked to the courtyard of olive trees, 
beneath a blue sun so bright it appeared to have been lit from below, past men and women dressed in simple robes toward the golden dome of the mosque and left my shoes at the door. I needed to cry, but hadn't been able to. Yeah, I, lo I love that passage, right? Al-Aqsa, which is such an important historical um, place for, for you know, the Muslim religion and for Palestinians, and it's been fought so much over. And I thought it was just a, a beautiful way of like also talking about something that appears in, in your previous novel, uh, Call Me Zebra, right? This sort of triangle of privilege, right? Where the unprivileged can be more privileged than others, right? And there's this whole uh, reflection on privilege, which is uh, amazing. And it reappears here in a very different way. I was actually, I think I told you that uh, many of, the, even like Call Me Zebra is a very different novel than this one, but there are lines of continuity, of thematic continuity. And one of those is sort of the question of privilege, even amongst uh, people who are in exile. But regarding the question of exile, which is a very central question, uh, I think, in your work, uh, Azadin, uh, I was thinking that there is sort of also, a, a, there's like two forms of exile that you've been working on. One seems to be uh, the violence of territorial displacement, right? Uh, but then the other one is the identity displacement. I love the sentence when the, uh, the um, Arezu is told, you are not a Muslim, right? Where does that that come from? What does that mean? Um, and reclaiming God for a character that doesn't seem to be particularly interested in religion as a sort of as, a, as an armor, as a form of defense, as a form of reclaiming uh, identity. So sort of these two forms of displacement, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? What are your thoughts about this? Well, how, you, how have you come to these like many forms of displacement throughout your work and particularly in this novel? Yeah, I I mean, that's actually, it's illuminating for me to hear you talk about it in that way, you know, like um, that distinction between territorial displacement and identity displacement, and then the ways that they get layered on top of one another. And yeah, I mean, it's something that I think about constantly. I mean, in Call Me Zebra, she's like a very funny character and she's talking about the pyramid of exile. And it, I hadn't even connected those two, two, two things. Um, but here the tone is so much more sober, I think, and so much more grave. And I think part of it is because of this cultural context that we're living in, the climate we've been in of extremism right, of reactionary politics, of um, fanaticization on all sides. You know, we see it um, sort of a fanatic clinging to, to whiteness that's really destructive to every community, the white community included. And, you know, then this, you know, even in the Middle East, there's a lot of like clinging to and, and this polarization um, that's very extreme. And, and I think, that that creates identity displacement even when we're not displaced physically because more and more people i think are you know um i was talking to somebody recently about how you know you know you're american when you you're struggling with ambivalence about being american and you constantly fantasize about wanting to leave right <laughs> we even talked about it briefly um like and and you know, my friend just said, this person I was speaking to who's just incredibly intelligent, well, Ozzy, you're American. <laughs> that makes you American. And I thought, well, that's true, you know, because I hear people saying that uh, who've either immigrated here at a really young age or have been living here their whole lives. Like um, in this moment, it's so hard to feel like a sense of belonging uh, to the community and to the imagination of a nation or to the national imaginary that is America. Um, and of course that sense of belonging is frustrated when all of the violences that we've experienced and have been enacted historically in the American landscape are kind of coming to the surface in really critical and visible ways that are undeniable, but that we haven't con 
you know, confronted. Um, we haven't looked at it and we don't know how to cultivate belonging while acknowledging historical violence. Nobody's taught us, you know, there's just been denial. And so the second that it all comes to the surface, you just want, you know, we all just want to exit. Um, but I think the reason I wrote this book is, is kind of to make an argument almost, you know, it's not the work of the novel to make an argument, but it's an emotional mm -hmm. argument that there is no other choice but to lean into the trauma, to really lean into it and to really be in that grief free fall um, for ourselves as people, as individuals, for our micro communities, and then for political, territorial, linguistic communities. It just keeps rippling outward. Um, and the whole world is unstable right now. You know, I don't know that any corner of the world is spared from whatever it is that that's happening. Um, on a different topic, do you hear me well or am I like breaking up for you? There's a crackle, but I hear you really well. Do you not hear me very well? Okay. Okay, good. So I'm going to ask a last question. I, I think that there might be questions uh, on the chat, which I have no access to, but I'm hoping somebody will, from Books and Books will, will come up and uh, sure. bring questions from the audience, I hope. I would, this is my last question for you. Um, it has to do with the question of time. Um, you know, we've talked about territory, we've talked about language, we've talked about bodies. Uh, we haven't talked about the question of time, which is also a reflection or a meditation that is very much um, spoken about throughout the novel. Um, you were saying, yes, novels do not bring an argument, and it's absolutely true, unless unless it's a very terrible and bad, badly written novel, right? Or, or actually a novel that is actually disguising an essay. But this is a meditation, right? And there are very interesting and strong and beautiful ideas that are that, that are sort of navigating through these characters who are two very, very smart women um, who, who've done the work of thinking about what they feel, what they've experienced, what the politics around, around them are. And one of the things they talk about is how the past is really very much in the present of our bodies, right? How we are reliving the past. And this is very eloquently done in the fact that Arezu is always like, like when she goes back to Spain, she's in, into her old apartment. She is listening and re, not only reliving, but re-listening to Omar's words, what he used to say, how he used to smell. Suddenly it's as almost as if he's a, a ghost, right, who is haunting the house. But he's the past, but he's also the present. And there's also some reflections about the future. Um, and also uh, culturally, the question of time, um, I think you mentioned how the linearity of time from in the West doesn't coincide with the time, how it's uh, lived uh, in other places. Could you, you, could you maybe talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that and why this is so important, also even for novel writing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think novels are um, like all about duration, you know, like a, a novel is recording the passage of time and it's a central way that we organize and plot, you know, the, the main events on a line of a book um, and design the architecture. Uh, I think when, you know, the, sen the American literary sensibility or the Western literary sensibility is, is more linear, it's more chronological and it's more sort of fast paced and event centered, like something has to happen. There's, it's action oriented and you know, coming from a culture or a civilization that's really ancient and has had displacement, multiple displacements, um, I think there's so much more. The scale of time that we have to uh, position our own psyches and bodies in is so much larger, right? Um, it's, we don't come from young countries. And having to deal with that scale just kind of makes it impossible to not constantly have to revise, right? Because the, your you know, characters are also asking, who am I? How did I get here? How did this thing that's happening to me or that, that you know, I'm inside of begin, right? Like, where did it begin? Um, where did the story of 
Omar and Arzu began. It could have begun, did it begin with the you know Lebanese civil war? If that hadn't happened, this wouldn't have happened. Um, did it begin with American violence? If if you know her brother hadn't been uh, almost killed, would she have encountered Omar and let him into her life? So that's also a question that the book is asking: is where does a story begin? Um, and you know, yeah, what are the boundaries of our identity? So yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. Wow. So. What a wow, what a conversation. I mean, like, really, there is a lot to unpack. And what a moderator. Oh, my God, what a thoughtful <laughs> reading of this work. Truly, truly amazing. So um, I want to remind everyone watching that now is a really good time to put your questions in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, and here's one. Um, what has it been like to write and publish in this time of the pandemic? Oh, <laughs> it's tricky. Um, you know, on the one hand, what a great problem to have, you know, that, that the, the thing, and, and Lena's book just came out as well. So I think we can both speak to this. Um, it, it hasn't been easy, right, Lena, just this, this environment of the virtual situation and the tremendous distance that I, I feel um, having been stuck just in my own room on Zoom constantly. But I, I think it's also a really good moment of reckoning and hopefully people are um, more eager to, to read and try to come to terms with all of these conversations that are happening about you know politics and identity and sexuality and race i mean it's just in the news constantly um so i think we do we do have to start complicating the discourse and really looking at these things so i'm you know i'm i'm happy to to have a book come out in this moment um despite how remote and distant i feel from everyone um socially yeah i don't know lena what about you about me? Yeah. How you um, well, yeah. You know, it's interesting because um, the fact that suddenly Zoom and all these other platforms appeared in our lives has suddenly really changed the conversation. Before, one had to travel, which was, you know, very tiring sometimes. Touring is very difficult. Actually, uh, um, other in your book talks about this because the character is coming to Spain after touring and she's very exhausted, right? And I felt very identified with that character at that point um, because it has been very exhausting, the, the touring part, but having the possibility of sitting down and talking not only to people in one, in one bookstore, right, mm -hmm. but actually talking to so many other people and having that possibility has really enlarged, I think for me at least, the literary conversation and the conversation about books. And, you know, it has its own um, difficulty and it's also very tiring sometimes, Zoom after Zoom, but it's also sort of engaged more people. And I know for a fact that many people are reading more because yeah. they're not commuting as much right and because they've had like more time at home those of us who have the privilege right and uh the need for books but i do think that the the, the reading sort of the reading world was amplified and the conversation was somehow amplified i hope that that is actually true and i'm not being excessively optimistic in a dire moment I, but i think that that is very true that has been our experience it's also been remarkable the people you can bring together mm -hmm. um, on a virtual event, you know, uh, the conversations mm -hmm. you can have and also the intimacy of those conversations. Mm -hmm. And we found that our audiences have followed us. The literary community has followed us. And also we've we found that people are watching from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself yeah. is, is quite interesting. So um, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, so someone would like to see if you can speak a little more about female interiority. Okay. 
Just in general? Just in general, that's, that's the way it reads. Um, well, female interiority is, is vast, expansive, and complex. <laughs> Um, I, I, I mean, I actually really appreciate how open that question is it, because I think we need so much, it's just an indicator of how much more access we need to female interiority and to queer and intersectional interiority, which are also a big part of this novel. Um, but mm -hmm. this novel aside, we just need to be reading and discussing and thinking about books and films that are female centered, female produced, right? Um, it's, there's a great documentary that I don't remember the name of actually just up now on Netflix about the film industry and Hollywood and the way that women have been not centered. They're always sort of devices to advance the male characters. Um, and, and that's just in the characters of the movies, not the actresses themselves who are also coming forward about the deep sexism in the industry. And, and so these are two separate but interconnected things that I think we need to really, and we are talking about for sure, just the representation of femininity on the page and then the women who are creating the art or are part of the art maybe and, and being blocked or not able to get those same opportunities to actually produce and design and um, you know, execute. And that's true for, more true for women of color, you know, um, for queer women of color and, and on and on, you know, um, again, that the sort of layers of, of privilege and the ways that we can be both privileged and underprivileged at the same time in different aspects of our identity, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that also, there's progress oh, being made? The fact that we're having this conversation is progress. The fact that women are c coming together um, in, in collective ways, you know, like Lena was saying earlier about how violence is, a, is, is actually community based and it impacts community in order to heal and make progress and grieve. And he, you know, that requires community, right? And, and I do think that, I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of how, um, you know, women who are of different backgrounds and sexuality orientation, sexual orientations um, and gender expressions support one another. Um, I think that there's a lot of nuance there that, um, you know, needs to be discussed and explored. But I think that we're having the conversation. Um, and, you know, I, for one, I love speaking to other women writers who, you know, like Lena, you're Chilean, you have Palestinian ancestry, you live in the United States. It's all of these layers of, of identity that then allow us to have a conversation um, that's complex, right? Uh, so, yeah, I think we're making progress. But I, I don't let that um, make me rest easy, I suppose, but that's just my character. What do you think, Lena? No, I was going to say that on the question of intimacy on this particular novel, what I really loved about this book, I mean, among, among the many things I loved about it, uh, is that there is not the sort of the lonely woman in her intimate self trying to figure out what happened and how to um, exorcise that moment, it's actually happening in a sort of conversation with a friend, right? And the friend asks and the friend also tells and that sort of community with this other woman who is not Muslim, but Jewish, right? Uh, sort of this community indifference and the way in which um, Azarin is thinking about not traditional and normative communities, that, but sort of other forms of bonding, which which are larger and different than just family, right? Because we don't choose our families, but we can choose our friends. Mm. So the fact that this intimacy is being worked out and communicated is really a form of, a, I think, of expansion of the traditional sort of woman who thinks by her, herself in silence, very oppressed. Uh, and this is sort of a moment of 
agency where, where friendship is actually allowing them both to heal. And so I thought that that is sort of a super important thing in a, in a book written by, by a woman today. Well, you are both incredibly deep thinkers. And I want to just share, I mean, just thank you for this conversation here virtually. I want to remind everyone who's watching that we have the book at all of our stores. Come by and pick up a copy. If you want to order it here, you just press the green button and we will ship it right off to you. And then we, we're almost done with our time. But I have a question about, I just am curious, what do bookstores mean to you? <laughs> is there a memory or is there something special about them that you would share with us before we go? I mean, of course, there's so much special about them. Um, I uh, just... I, I immediately feel physically relaxed when I walk into a really good bookstore. Um, it's particularly true with independent bookstores because they're just so beautifully and thoughtfully curated and the space is intimate. And you just, I think for a writer to be in a space where you're immersed in 360 de you know, degrees immersed in words, it, it's a pretty special experience. Um, and and I, I really love like old libraries too. Um, any place that's preserving and archiving human language uh, is just, you know, what else could I ask for as a writer? Yeah, and just to say one, one add one word to that is that, you know, for me, I wasn't a person that grew up with people who read that much or talked about books. So my first experiences as a young woman, 15 year old, 16 year old, was like actually going into these uh, used books stores uh, where there were young uh, uh, readers and people who recommended me books. And that's actually sort of the recommendation of books, which is so, so important. And I kind of followed my favorite uh, bookkeepers, booksellers, because they actually read and they could recommend. And they, after a while, they knew what I liked and what I could be interested in. And so it was me, even like out of school, before university, just a very formative experience to be able to grab a book. I mean, I, I was brought up in a place where when you went to, to the libraries, you couldn't access the stacks. You had to wait like half an hour for the book to come by. You couldn't take it home. Uh, we read and I studied <laughs> everything. In, yeah, in photocopies. I studied with photocopies of books. Never had like real books. So so these used bookstores and the sellers were just these incredible people who are usually students of literature mm -hmm. who recommended all these readings. And I like, I'm so, so grateful for that. So bookstores made me in a way a writer. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. So, um, sure. have you ever been to our bookstore, the Books and Books in Miami? You need no. to. You need to. You both need to come. I've only <laughs> been to Miami once years ago for the book fair, and um, gosh, I think it was 2015. So we were just in and out. We did an, our event. But I, yeah, next time I'm in Miami for sure. Next time in Miami, please. Sure. Okay, wonderful. All right. Well, thank you to everyone. Thank you to Miami Book Fair for supporting this event. Thank you for joining us and um, stay safe. Keep doing what you do, which is to, to write beautifully. And thank you for the privilege of this conversation. Thank you. And thank you, thank you Nina. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Good night, everyone.